You're listening to the Zandbergen Report, where wealth strategies and investment wisdom collide with Bart Zandbergen, your distinguished host and certified financial planner. Welcome to the Zandbergen Report, showcasing wealth strategies and investment wisdom that is essential for your revolving world. I'm Letitia Burbaum, your guest host today. Thank you, Paul, our engineer here at the studio. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we've been sitting here for a half hour just talking before the show here and getting ready as usual. (laughs) Thank you so much for having us here. We really appreciate it. So fun. So today, really exciting. Um, We're doing um, a fantastic guest that I've known for many, many, many years and someone who I have really looked up to as a child and I have um, watched grow and develop and has actually been somewhat of a mentor. I don't know if he actually knows this, but he's going to know this now. So they have, him and his wife have um, built a substantial life legacy. And within that, they have purchased many commercial real estate shopping centers um, located in Washington State. And um, they've been purchasing the real estate since 1999. And they also started investing before that in um, residential in 1994. And before that, their business really started with business ownership and franchisees. So he's really done um, a full circle of different businesses as in owning your own business and commercial business and real estate. So really excited to have him on the show today and really maybe share with us a little bit about since his journey, maybe how he was able to really pass that on to the next generation. So before I go on too much, I'd like to introduce uh, Jim O'Sullivan. Uh, Hi, Letitia and Paul. This is Jim O'Sullivan. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you being part of our show today. Thank you for calling in. I appreciate that. Delighted. No problem. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself. Well, interestingly enough, even though I live in Seattle, I was raised in Spokane, but I went to high school in San Clemente. Nice, right around the corner from here. I know, I know. So I thought that was sort of unique and interesting. Then we moved to San Diego, and I went to two years of college in San Diego. And from there, I got into a franchise business, and I started at the bottom, of course, and then worked really hard until I got to the point where I could no longer be just a teacher. I became a supervisor, then a manager, then an owner. Mm. And the reason that I sought the ownership is because I saw the reward. And what I thought was, if a person's at the top, they don't have to work very hard. Yep. Well, I was surprised. <laughs> that, that didn't turn out that way. You worked I harder. Out. I know. When I got to the top, now I was beholden to all of my employees, all of my customers, and all sorts of government regulations, etc. But even still, it was more than worthwhile, and so that's where we stayed. From there, we, from time to time, had team motivational meetings and Mm get-togethers. Now I'm back in the Seattle area, and someone suggested, why don't we rent a boat and go boating in the San Juan Islands? Mm, That's right. So we did that, or I did that, and we brought all of our employees out on this boat, and then uh, as time went by three boats all together to hold those who had done the best job. And so that was our, our plan. And when we did that, I realized when I had my employees out on the boat and they were jumping off the boat and doing all sorts of crazy things, as, as young people do, that this is dangerous and I could end up having one of my employees get killed, if you right. will. The liability now. Yep. So from that, I decided to... I learned a little bit about boating, and then I got motivated again Mm -hmm. and ended up becoming a mega yacht captain. I have a U.S. Coast Guard license as a captain for a 500-ton ocean, and so that is what I do as a hobby. That's an impressive hobby, Jim. uh, That's a fun way to make money while in your hobby, which is another venue of uh, having a good time and, and, and earning a little extra spending money, if you will. I love it. That sounds great. So anyway, then what happened was is that we sold our business in 1990, Mm -hmm. and then at that point in time, we thought, wow, I like this franchise business, and this coffee thing seems to be something we can get caught up on and make make that into a successful venue. So 
So we ended up owning six locations in the coffee business. And when Starbucks went public, that's when I realized that my idea of a, as a franchise model was the wrong model. They had the right idea and in-house locations, more control over what they were doing, more control over their people and their product. And so we sold our locations. Um, went to work for a security company in, in Irvine, actually, Irvine, California. And during that time was when we rented our home out in the Seattle area. And then we came back to Seattle because my our children started having children. I mean, our son and our daughter started having children. My wife says, you know what, forget about this traveling around the world on this mega yacht that was parked and home based in Newport Beach, California. So we, at that point, moved back to Seattle, and we decided let's try this real estate thing. My wife loved the real estate from the standpoint of being an agent, and I thought let's try this idea of owning commercial real estate because we had a friend who kept saying that's what we should do is own real estate. So we took our first venture into that, Real commercial real estate. And when we did that, the first thing that happened was is that the bank says, well, we can't uh, loan you all this money on this property. So we convinced the seller to be a guarantor on the loan for a period of two years, knowing that if we didn't make the monthly payments, that we would lose it and the person we bought the property from would regain back all of our down payment and the property, and it would be two years more mature, if you will. Mm-hmm. So that's how we, how we did that. We took that risk. And by the way, something that, that I strongly believe in is that there was a study done of entrepreneurs, ex-CEOs who had retired from being very successful in their, whatever their field was. And the question was asked, what would they do different if they were to try, uh, if they were to do their life over again. And the most popular, the most common answer amongst these uh, retired CEOs was they would take more risk. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yes. So it- That's a philosophy that I think is ex- very important that I, I have lived by. Yeah. And I believe that when one takes risk, and if you fail, that's when you have an opportunity to learn. And so my feeling of risk is very valuable and very important in one's life or one's adventure through life. Likewise, I think that life is not a journey, but it is an adventure. And the reason I think that is because a journey sort of like, it's sort of like down a well-worn path. Right. Where by looking at life as an adventure, we see it with opportunity that abounds, with excitement that abounds. We always want to try something new and different. And so so my approach to life, if you will, is looking at it as an adventure and taking risk. Yeah. So you said to me before you want to pass this thought to your children and grandchildren, and you sit around the dinner table and really talk to them about risk and kind of thinking outside the box. And so you have four amazing grandchildren. Tell me a little bit about that question that you pose to them based on risk. So that your audience knows, I have one daughter and one son. Okay. And each of them have two children. Mm -hmm. All of them are boys. All four are boys. Mm -hmm. And they happen to be two years apart. One of the goals in my wife and I's our lives is to be closely associated with family Mm -hmm. and also more so even with our grandchildren because there's an opportunity i mean we took our best shot with our kids right but now we have our grandkids and maybe we can be more of a guiding influence with them so our goal was to spend a lot of time with our grandkids and the good news is our son and daughter gave us that opportunity be to be with their children often and frequently that's great so when we would go places in the car, I would put on, uh, we would talk about different things in life in an effort to stimulate their brain, if you will. 
I believe that children in particular are hardwired to learn. So it's important for those of us who are parents and grandparents is to do everything we can to feed that, that quest that, that young minds have. Taking advantage of teaching moments. Yes. And so as we would drive, instead of just driving and doing essentially nothing, we tried making use of our drive time as we took the kids to the lake or took them to the mountains or wherever. Right. And listened to audio tapes. Yeah. And so that was our fun thing to do. And then what happened was our oldest of the four grandkids was graduating from the sixth grade. And my wife came to me and said, We need to get them a gift. (laughs) Yes, we've got to get them a gift. I said, what do you mean get them a gift? (laughs) What did he do? He he graduated in the the sixth grade. I said, well, doesn't everybody? Is this a big accomplishment? Right. And then she gave me that look, and I realized, okay, I got it. (laughs) We've got to get him a gift. So what I did was I thought, let's shirt tail on what we had been working with the kids from time to time. Yeah. As we were working with them, and that is I printed up a certificate in my computer and in the certificate, it said, this entitles you to a hundred shares, or was a hundred dollars, I don't remember which, of SIRI stock. And I put it on a, a, a paper and put it in a big envelope. So we went to the graduation <clears throat> and were ready to hand the young man his uh, gift. He had this eager look in his eyes, oh, he's going to get this great gift from Grandma and Grandpa. <laughs> so he pulls this sheet of paper out, and it says... 100 shares of SIRI stock. Now, did he know what the stock was? He had no idea. (laughs) He he had no idea. He's in sixth grade. (laughs) Right. So then what happened was, I said, his his big grin went from a grin to a, like, what happened here? This quizzical look. (laughs) So I said, well, look on the back side. And on the back side were 10 questions that said, what is SIRI stock? Serious satellite radio. Yeah. I didn't tell him that, but he had to figure that out. He had to go find it out. Yeah. And how many shares are outstanding, and what is the price per share, et cetera. And those questions, I said, once you answer those questions, then we will receive your gift of this 100 shares of Sirius satellite radio stock. So he had to answer those questions. And then there was a philosophy at the end which said, it does not matter how much you earn on this stock. It's more important to how much you learn That's on this so stock, important. That is on this investment. That right there is a fundamental important point that you just said that you're not just handing over a, a gift just because they're graduating sixth grade. What you're saying is you took a teaching moment to say, Yes, of course I'm gonna still give you a gift, but I'm now going to provide you an opportunity to really learn something big picture. In your example, a stock and understanding the basics of what that is in a company, and then he actually was able to get the stock at the end. So that's amazing. Yeah, but he had, yeah, but he had to study for it. He had yep. to continue learning. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's so important and so critical. So we're trying to establish a philosophy of life yeah. for this young man yeah. to make wise decisions when he's on his own, if you will. Right. And so that was the goal and the purpose. Now, two years later, the next young man comes along. He's graduating the sixth grade. He's waiting for his stock certificate, too. Right. (laughs) So we decided, wait a minute, okay, we got stock through the first kid, so let's do something. And we also pointed out that the critical learning, other learning moment in stock is that this enables you to be a shared owner of that particular business. Right. So you get to share in the successes and the failures, etc. So the next kid comes along and he, we give him a bond. So he receives his certificate upon his graduation, and on the back side of this certificate for a double E bond were the 10 questions, which is what is a T bill? What is a municipal bond? What is a treasury? Well, I just said the treasury bill. What is a, uh, a corporate bond, etc.? And he had to answer those questions and understand that a bond is a loan. Mm-hmm. And so, what was interesting. One of the kids says, Granddad, it says here, uh, a treasury bond. He says, are you telling me that people loan the government money? I said, yes, they do. That's why it's a bond. That's a treasury bill. The light bulb went off. He goes, wow, (laughs) he had no idea that that's where much much of the money comes from, from the government anyway. Mm. And so that was another learning moment, Yeah, uh, that it was a loan in essence. 
Okay, there's Jim, um, we're going to take a real quick break Okay. Um, for a commercial, and we'll be right back. Perfect. All right. I'll be here. Everyone knows that moving is one of the most stressful times in a person's life. And the worst part? Searching for cardboard boxes. It's absolutely prehistoric. Digging through dumpsters, going from store to store, buying stacks of them. You're only going to throw away later. Well, now there's an answer. Bungo Box. Bungo Boxes are durable, stackable, eco-friendly, plastic moving containers that will cut the cost of your packing supplies in half. And they're made of hard plastic, which gives you much more protection for your precious belongings. Much better than cardboard. Bungo boxes hold over 100 pounds per box, plus our boxes never, ever need tape. That's right, no tape. But since our Bungo boxes come with fitted dollies, your movers will move at the speed of light. So whether you, your friends, or your office are moving, there's really only one solution, Bungo Box. Find out more at BungoBoxOC.com. That's BungoBoxOC.com. Or call 714-725-7292. You order them, we deliver them. You move, we pick them up. That's BunkoBoxOC.com. When you use the Premier Rewards Gold Card from American Express, the rewards points can keep on multiplying. Buy three with triple points on airfare. Buy two with double points on gas and groceries. And a single point for pretty much every other dollar you spend on the card. Then, start choosing from over a million rewards to redeem all those points. Apply today and the annual fee for the first year is on us. Call 1-800-AXP-GOLD or visit AXPGOLD.com. The annual fee for the card is $175. See terms, conditions, and restrictions at AXPGOLD.com. All right, back to Letitia and her guest. Thank you so much, Paul. So I wanted to be able to, um, you know, also say one thing. As my experience over the years, I've seen many people build um, wealth or success in, like you just said, the CEOs in many different ways. And one I've seen is being a business owner. Another one I've seen is through investments. And the last one I've seen is real estate. And again, there's a lot of other ways to become successful, but those are some of the three most consistent ones that I've seen throughout my career. You've actually had experience in all three of these, Jim. So if there's a way that you can share with us how um, maybe, like you said, one of the four um, grandsons that you have, how you've been able to apply one of these teaching moments, maybe just one of your many teaching moments with us on those pillars. The other thing we did is we formed a company and we made it a goal. Everybody wants to become a millionaire, but I said, you know what, rather than starting with becoming a millionaire, let's start with becoming a thousandaire. Mm -hmm. So this became their goal and my promise was that they each became a thousandaire and they all four had to become a thousandaire, that I would add to their money by a multiple of four, four thousand and that collectively we put that money into a pot and buy a house. Okay. A rental house. Okay. And so what we did was we went to foreclosure auctions in the state of Washington, which occur weekly, and we bought a foreclosure house. And just to give you the quick numbers, they bought the house for a hundred I'll round it off, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. And we went out immediately and had it appraised. It appraised at $200,000. The lender, the banks, were willing to, to give us 75% of the appraised value of the house. That means they bought the house for free mm. because they got all their money back. They had to use a hard money lender for a period of about mm, just under 60 days. So that cost them about three or $4,000 for in order to borrow the 150000 to buy the house. But so they're totally into it, essentially $155,000 for a house that's worth 200000 Today that house is worth three hundred and sixty to $75,000. That's a great so, profit. So they've made about, if they sell that house today using a 1031 exchange so they don't have to pay tax on their income, that's important mm-hmm. to learn is to not pay tax on their income. So they're now taking an essentially uh, $250,000 profit from that house and buying a commercial property. Now, 
the importance of buying commercial property is that you can earn money four ways in commercial property. And I did not understand that early on in my career because I didn't understand what those different elements were to make that up. Our kids' goal is to take the $250,000, buy a million-dollar property, i.e. putting 25% down, and borrowing the $750,000. Today, you can buy a million-dollar property almost anywhere in the country, commercial property, and receive anywhere from a 6 to 7% return on your money. In other words, that's called the cap rate. Or if it were a savings account, that would be the interest rate. So on a million-dollar property, that would produce sixty to $70,000 a year in income. That's a nice cash flow. Yes, that's what we call a positive cash flow. And that, that positive cash flow is the free cash flow, if you will, because there are other monies that the tenants pay which go to the maintenance of the property, the taxes on the property, the insurance on the property, and the management of the property. Those are what we call triple nets. And that means that we're going to be able to hire a professional management company to manage that property, collect the, the rent, and pay the bills, and provide a monthly financial statement. And that's included in the rent of the tenant. So they typically pay a base rent, and they pay a triple net expense. And they're covering all of their own expenses, and it's not affecting your cash flow. Right. So now I have a cash flow of sixty to seven th- seventy thousand dollars a year. I go to the bank. I borrow three quarters of a million dollars, or seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And my loan for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars at the current uh, bank interest rates. I just did a loan last month. That current interest rate is about 4.5%. That means that my, my annual cost of my loan is $50,000. That counts my principal and interest is $50,000. So if I'm able to borrow money at 4.5% and receive a 6.5% return on my money, how much money would a person borrow? Well, if I could borrow at 4.5% and get a return of 6.5%, I would want to borrow trillions. As much as you can. Because you're making 2% on the spread. Right. We have about two minutes left, so I want to be able to make sure that we are able to finalize your thought of this amazing story that you turned a residential into a commercial, cash flowing, their out-of-pocket essentially was minimal, and now they're already doing successfully, they're doing well with their commercial property. Yes, this is, in the, this is in the process, the one I just mentioned. And so this property, instead of going up like their currently $350,000 home, if the, if the appreciation on property, one of the ways you make money is the appreciation. So if the real estate goes up at 4 or 5% a year and you have a million-dollar property, that's a forty to $50,000 a year gain. Number two, the amount of money we put into this was leveraged at a three to one or a four to one leverage ratio. Yep. So I'm not just making a two percent return on my money or an eight percent, seven percent return on my money. I'm making let's say twenty one to twenty five percent return on my money of the actual money that I'm using to purchase the property. Then the the tenants are paying for the loan the whole amount of the loan and my loan is going down annually by the, the interest rate on that loan. I mean, the principal paid on, on that loan on, on a one-year basis is $16,000. So I'm, that's an, an automatic savings plan. Right. All I can say is that I urge anybody and everybody to try making the leap from residential to commercial. Exactly. And because in residential, tenants are concerned about things like are there breadcrumbs in the toaster or something like that. Exactly. Well, Jim, that's all the time that we have today. And I'd like to encourage, you know, listeners, if they want to know more, and I'd love to have you back in again. And I really appreciate your time. I'm sure that you and I can talk for hours and hours that you have so much knowledge. And I just want to thank you so much for being on our show today. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Tune in next week for the latest edition of the Zandbergen Report, Tuesdays at 2 p.m.
Catch up on our recent shows by visiting www.bartzanbergen.com. Interested in being a featured guest on our show or have a question you'd like to hear us answer on the Zandbergen Report? Email podcast at bartzandbergen.com. The Zandbergen Report is a production of OC Talk Radio and is provided for educational purposes only. The content of this program and the views of the guests should not be considered as recommendations by OC Talk Radio or investment advice from the host, Bart Zandbergen, or any other entity attached to this production. Investors should always consult qualified financial, investment, tax, or legal professionals prior to investing. 